Hey, it's Dan Kenner, host of The Casual Author. Today is Wednesday, July 5th, 2023, and this is episode number 83 of the podcast. Today we're talking to J.L. Lysett about how it is never too late to get started with your writing and publishing. I know that there's a lot of people out there who have wanted their whole lives to start writing and forever, for whatever reason, they're not. They think, oh, it's too late, I'm too old, or you know, you got to start when you're in your teens, in your 20s, whatever you may be thinking. But the truth of the matter is it is never too late to get started. So JL has a lot of great experience around this. She started a career um, as an oncologist and, and very uh, various other things, has a family, and then decided, you know, it's time. It's time to write a book. And she went ahead and did that. So definitely want to stick around for that conversation. We talk a lot about writer's block and things that can help combat that, as well as just overcoming your concerns with, uh, you know, starting a little bit later with your writing. So yeah, tune in for that. In terms of updates, so in terms of homestead updates, we'll go ahead and start with that. We're in a stable week. Not a lot has changed in terms of keeping track of the goats. We were able to sell off the bottle babies last week. I talked a little bit about that, but it's amazing how much time we have saved. It's one of those little things, right? You know, you're going out multiple times a day feeding them their bottles, coming in, having to wash them. It's not a big deal, but, you know, we're saving 30 minutes to 45 minutes a day not having to do that. And it's, you know, it's one of those things, just it adds up. So we're grateful for the extra time on that front. We had a great holiday yesterday. It's part of the reason I'm recording this a little bit later than expected. Uh, but, you know, it was fun to go out and, and spend a lot of time outside with the kids. And I we did a little bit of work. I spent some time working on our chicken tractor, the second chicken tractor. And I was able to finish that, which is nice. So once again, as a reminder, a chicken tractor is essentially a mobile coop that you put out and allow your chickens to be pastured. We like that. It makes their eggs, their egg yolks a lot more orange and they taste better. So we try to get our chickens out of their, you know, standing coop, their winter coop, we like to call it, so they can go dig at the ground, eat the seeds eat the plants they're much happier as well and and healthier and the eggs are better so uh it's nice that we'll have that second tractor we can get another batch of chickens out in the field the meat chickens are already out there uh, we put them out there last week they're thriving and it's amazing how fast they grow we will be um, processing them in just a few weeks which is nice they don't take up too much work but once again it's just another addition of more chores in the morning more choice and that chores in the afternoon um so, yeah, I'm looking forward to not having them <laughs> to take care of. But anyway, they're happy and healthy. They're, they're just eating away and, and living their best life. So in um, <laughs> in other news, my wife and I have been discussing potentially uh, getting a cow to replace the dairy goats. And I think we're pretty much set on doing that. So now what we need to do is figure out what infrastructure we need to put in place for a cow, and then we need to look at timing so that we can sell the goats appropriately. While we've appreciated the goats, we definitely don't want we don't want to get rid of the goats because of them being goats. It's mainly from the productivity standpoint. We are milking four goats at this time. It was five. We stopped milking one because she was kind of trouble. She's not very friendly, and her udder is awful. Um, so we're just milking four, and it takes you know forty five minutes to an hour, and we're only getting about a gallon of milk a day currently. We're only milking once a day. Once we sell the babies, we'll milk twice a day, and we'll get maybe two gallons, hopefully two gallons. But the reality is we're just not getting enough milk for the time it takes to milk them. So a cow is more productive, right? They can produce upwards of five to six gallons a day. We would need that milk. Um and you only have to milk one animal. So it just, it makes sense. It's a little bit nerve wracking because we've never had a cow before and we don't know much about it. So we're learning as much as we can. In any case, we will be selling all but three of the goats. We're keeping those goats, not for breeding and for milking. We will dry them up and we'll just keep them as pets, primarily to be a herd with the cow and her calf. Um, obviously we'll have a calf so we can share the milk with the calf. And then um, they will pasture together. So the cow will eat all of the grasses and the, the other plants and the goats will eat the weeds because our goats don't eat grass. They don't like it. They want the weeds. So together, they'll be able to clear our property a little bit better. And hopefully it'll simplify our lives having only one animal to milk instead of four, potentially more, because we were kind of planning on milking more and more over the years so we could get more milk. But just practically, time-wise, it doesn't make sense. So we'll have to hear a little bit more about that in the future. There's not a lot of solid plans quite yet. All we know is we will be getting a milk black cow we would rather get it sooner than later, but we've got to figure out some things. Winter is going to be a little bit tricky for, because of our water situation. We don't have any water close by that won't freeze. So 
Oh, you think it's really cold here? Cow will be fine. We'll have a shelter for her, but like getting water to her because she'll, she'll drink tons and tons of gallons a day. I'm not carrying buckets. <laughs> In the past, I've been carrying buckets out to the goats, but for a cow that will drink more, it's just not going to happen. So there you go. There's a little bit of a fun update on that front. Um, I feel like our homestead gets more and more complicated. We will be getting pigs at some point, but that's further down the future. So we're not going to talk about that today, but the homestead is turning into a farm. <laughs> Really, it's becoming less of a homestead and more of a farm. So that's kind of fun. In terms of authoring, I have been plugging along on Dragon Blood. I've been really enjoying the process, going through and editing. I'm more than halfway done with my first edits. Um, I am potentially working with a new editor. Um, I do enjoy the editor I was working with before. I will continue to work with her maybe in the future. But timing-wise, she's having a baby, which I'm very happy for her. Uh, does mean there's going to be some delays in the editing, which is totally fine. But yeah, I, the editor that I sent the first chapter with has edited it, just kind of a sample edit, and I've really enjoyed it. So I may be ending up with that new editor. What that means is the timing of Dragon Blooded won't be as late as I might as I thought it might have been. So I was kind of thinking maybe end of end of this year for publishing it, but it might be a little bit sooner if I can get the editor locked down and and everything, obviously in a positive way. If I can get that all figured out. But the edits are great. I am planning on sending it to beta readers still probably next week. I think it's the plan. Depends on if I want to pump it through pro writing a prior to that or not. There's going to be lots of typos and other comma issues if I don't do it in pro writing aid. But I want to get to beta readers as soon as possible. So we'll kind of see where I end on that front. But yeah, the story is really fun. I It's been probably the most enjoyable editing experience so far. I think my writing has improved quite a bit. And it's a little bit of an easier read. It's a first person uh, book, which those are always way easier to read is YA. So generally, I can work through it a little bit more quickly. My co-author is back from her vacation. So we are jumping back into writing the second book of the Cyber City Kids, the kids of Cyber City, rather. That is the um, sci-fi middle grade uh, trilogy that we're writing. Um, it's really fun to get back into that, having a blast. So other than that, I don't think, oh, the other thing I, I am working, figuring on the covers for the um, Dragon Blooded series it doesn't have a name quite yet, but trying to sort out uh, how to work with that. I have an idea. I think I'm going to go with more of a symbolic type of approach to the cover instead of people on the cover. I just think it's going to deliver better. And for the six book series, I think it makes a little bit more sense. I've been playing with Mid Journey too to kind of come up with the elements of that. I don't anticipate that my cover artist will use the AI generated pieces that I've put together, but it's great for templating. You know, I can send him these images, say, hey, I want these on the cover or out like something like these. And he can use that as the basis to draw then, you know, a different version of that. So I'm looking at kind of insignia, kind of emblem type covers. And Mid Journey has been amazing for generating that. It's been fun to come up with it. And I've been impressed with how it comes out so far. It's been really beautiful. And I think they'll be really engaging and exciting covers. So that's fun. If you are someone, an author who has a hard time imagining visually what you want the cover to look like, I definitely recommend Mid Journey. You know, even whether or not you're making your covers with AI, I'm not going to talk about my opinion on that right now. But even if you just need the ideation phase, you need a uh, kind of something to help you visualize or put into art form what you think sometimes you put in art in mid journey and think oh i think this is going to turn out great and then it generates it and you think oh that is not <laughs> what i thought it would look like that's not delivering as i hoped it would and then sometimes you put in the prompt and it comes out and it's just beautiful it's exactly what you're looking for and that's what's happening in this case it's, it's exactly what i'm looking for and i think it's going to be amazing on the covers so kind of fun if you need that kind of imaginative play for your covers to kind of come up and give an idea of what you want on the covers. I definitely recommend mid journey. It also helps with putting your characters into a visual format. I don't have any artistic skill. And while I would love to commission every artist to draw character sketches for me, it is just not super cost effective. And so this AI generation is a little bit more cost effective and it helps you imagine things a little bit better. So definitely recommend it. Um, it's worth the cost if you're a new author and you just need a little bit of a uh, visual spurring for your writing. So I believe uh, that's all that I have for updates this week. So we can go ahead and shift over to the interview portion of the podcast. Hey, Jennifer, how are you today? I'm great, Dan. How are you? Doing great. Uh, excited to to learn from you. Every time I meet an author who has different experiences from me, I'm always 
so excited to dig into it and learn anything that I can. Um, and for you, I always, you may know this, but I like to start, how long have you been writing and publishing books? Yeah. So I started writing books, um, uh, almost seven years ago, I started writing my first book, but it actually was just published a few months ago, um, in March. And so, um, it's been, uh, yeah, almost a seven year journey, but it's been a real great process of discovery and writing. And I have my, uh, second book actually coming out later this year as well. That's awesome. So you write thrillers, correct? That's kind of the genre that you generally write in. Yeah. Thriller and suspense. My, uh, first book is a near future medical thriller. And then, um, my second book is actually, it's a prequel to that. So it's, um, like if I had to classify it, I guess I'd call it a, a historical medical suspense. Um, so kind of writing in the, um, medical fiction arena. Well, do you have experience with in the medical field? Is that somewhere where you worked historically or you just have an interest in it? Yeah, actually, I am a physician. So I'm oh, a practicing awesome. uh, physician. Um, I'm a hematologist oncologist, which uh, basically just means I am a specialist in blood and cancer medicine. I know what that means, actually, because yeah. my mom has had breast cancer. So oh, okay. she's a survivor. So that's good. No, that's oh, good news. Uh, she's actually had it. cancer a couple of times, but yeah, we it's kind of in the past. It was years and years ago and she's doing great now, but oh, yes. glad to hear she's doing well. Yes. We feel very grateful that we caught it early, but this isn't about that. It's awesome <laughs> to hear that you have that background and that you also have this interest in novel writing. So yeah. if you always loved reading, what led you into this writing fiction? Uh -huh. Yeah, I have always loved reading. I am just a lifelong bookworm and um, was a very early reader. Like one of my first memories is actually like um, reading in like preschool. <laughs> and um, growing up, so like I'm Gen X, so like, you know, pre online and social media era. And so I just read... Um, like every book in the house, like every, so I was reading probably things I shouldn't have read when I was a kid, but just mm -hmm. because I would read the books my parents had around. And my dad was a big thriller reader. So, um, um, just like a, a lot of like, um, like military thrillers and like, um, I think just, you know, sort of all that genre reading, I kind of internalized. And then as I, um, went into healthcare, like I started reading, of course, like uh, Robin Cook and, you know, the original medical thriller coma just had a huge impact on me. And so I think like I really internalized all this over the years. And I, um, I never thought I of myself as a writer, to be honest, but then in my early 40s, I um, sort of went through some things in life and my career that I turned to writing as really an outlet. And at first I was writing a lot of uh, like personal essays and narrative medicine and, and, and publishing those. And then after a few years of that, I, um, I just got this uh, idea in my head for my first book. And then um, it just kind of took it, took it from there. And even, and even though I had never written a book uh, and I, I think now looking back, like this was so naive of me that just like, Oh, I think I'll, I'll write a novel. Um, but I had so much fun just in the process of it, like um, just learning about writing and, and writing books and the power of story. And um, it was just something that um, really, um, became an outlet for me, especially, you know, in my day-to-day -day job. And I think the two just really kind of help balance each other. Mm. And um, it, of course, writing a book was much, much harder than I ever <laughs> imagined it would be. But um, it, it's been such a wonderful process and, and just meeting so many great people in the writing community as well. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't take it back for anything. It's really cool to hear, you know, very realistic because I think there's, there's a lot of people who I talk to, it doesn't really matter when your writing journey starts. I think it's, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I've been writing since I was like five or, you know, my entire life. I also had to be one of those people like, I've always wanted to write a book, but it's just kind of too scared to. I was like, I don't know if I'll ever get to that point. 
until, you know, I was 28 and finally buckled down and did it and realized this is hard. Well, wow, this is so worth it. Right? Like this is incredible. I didn't, this whole world that you didn't know was there just opened up. Um, and it's cool to experience that even if you, you know, you're a little bit older and there's a lot of authors that have been, you know, they start when they're teenagers and great. I think that's awesome. But if you're listening and you've wanted to write a book and well, you're 50, you're 60, however old you are, it's never too late, right? You can start whenever. So from your experience, given that you just published your first book recently, um, you said you've been writing for somewhere around seven ish years. Is that what you said? For yeah, for fiction writing, that's about for right. Yeah, writing. right. Uh, as a doctor, I'm sure you write all sorts of other things, um, research and 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 whatnot. But for you, were there any fears or apprehensions you had as you got started with writing that maybe you can share about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, very much so. I think this is so universal. Like, right. I think writers, like we, um, we want people to read what we wrote, but then there's like so much fear of Mm. people like actually reading what we wrote. And, and for me, like branching, branching out into fiction and now having my book in the world, like there's, there's nothing that like, um, gives me more anxiety than like someone I actually know and work with, like emailing me like, Hey, I'm reading your book. (laughs) Like it's fine. Right. If strangers read this, but then when it's like, you know, people in our everyday world. And Mm -hmm. so, um, so that definitely uh, is still something I'm struggling with. And I think, um, you know, when you write fiction, like, even when the story is completely fictional, like we draw from our own lives and experiences. Right. Mm -hmm. But then we fictionalize it. And and so um, this sort of apprehension of like, Oh gosh, are people going to read this and think this is me? Like, you know what I mean? Like um, uh, these are characters. And I think of course there's a little bit of us in all our characters. I think even the villains, Um, but of course, um, there, you know, intentionally, I think one of the fun things in writing is like when you're, you're writing a scene and you think like, what would be the most surprising or, um, outrageous thing that could happen in this scene and then writing that, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and one of the, f- you know, fun things of being an author is you can write things that you would never do in real life. So, but then like the sphere, yeah. once it's out there is, um, yeah, especially like people, you know, <laughs> there is always that. And I wish I mean, I'm not I wouldn't call myself an experienced author, right? I've been writing for a similar amount of time as you. I published five books since 2020. Um, that's when my first awesome. one was published. But still, yeah, there is that hilarious apprehension of anybody, you know, so you're like, I don't want to know. Like, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you reading it? Did you yeah. like it? But as Tame was like, I'm never going to ask you those questions. I'm just going to yeah. sit here and, and hope that at some <laughs> point you say you finished it or you liked it or whatever. But it's yeah, it's crazy how that is. And yeah. my impression is that the more you care about other people and the more people you know in your life, um, the more this kind of apprehension kind of crops up. Because when I was younger, I probably would have been far less nervous to let someone read something. Cause I'm just like, I'm a teenager. I don't know. I'm just figuring this out as I go, but yeah. I'm like, I should have my life together. Right. I'm an adult <laughs> it, for some reason in my mind that translates to this book should be perfect and be all put together. But we all know that's not always true, particularly yes. when you're writing your first book. So um, I always, <laughs> I'm always so curious for people who write thrillers because there's a strange kind of, uh, I don't mean this in a negative way, but twisted kind of viewpoint you kind of have to have on things. And I've never written thriller. I only write fantasy. I've written kind of dystopian. So I guess it kind of applies there. But how do you get in the right mindset to come up with this kind of thriller, suspenseful story, particularly from a villain's perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I'll try to answer that. It's a really tricky question. Um, I mean, even sure if it's just personal for you, right? Like, yeah. what, I mean, what did you yeah. do? Um, yeah, well, I think like, um, like, oh gosh, what, what is a saying? Like, um, um, like 
the more true fiction is, the more believable and, and the more um, like not true nonfiction seems, the more there's like some saying about that. Like I'm, I'm totally messing it up, but um, I think like some stories uh, just lend themselves to being told by fiction. And so for myself, like the, um, the story I wanted to tell and, and how like, I got the idea for my book seven years ago is that um, even though AI seems like new to a lot of people just these past few months, like in healthcare, AI has actually been around for a couple decades. And there was something that was happening in my field, oncology in the 2010s, where they were using uh, Watson, the the Watson Health machine learning AI to try to help uh, fine tune oncology diagnoses and treatment. And there was a huge hype behind it. And I, um, you know, practicing on oncology. So I have a, a medical and before that, um, biochemistry background, you know, I'm not a computer scientist, but I just, I became very interested in it and was following it. And then it all at the, like sort of, um, late 2010s just fizzled out. And, I just found it all so fascinating. And then this past decade, you know, being a practicing physician in healthcare and all these uh, pressures over, you know, obviously I think anyone living in the U S who's intersected with the healthcare system, who's basically everybody is aware of, you know, sort of the, the corporatization of healthcare and the, the, you know, insurance companies, prior authorizations, denials. So it just, I just had this thought like, um, like, what if they developed a new AI that was everything they wanted Watson to be, but then like basically like the wrong people were in charge of it. And and I think that's a like very common trope in the science fiction thriller genre. And so that was um, like kind of uh, the spark for my story. And then in terms of the character, I wanted to write about, like, I just started thinking, well, like, what kind of characters would buy into this and, 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 you know, would support it and, and how, how could things get twisted and basically how does the moral compass go the wrong way? And so, um, so the very interesting thing is that this book was published just three months ago, shortly after chat GPT like exploded and for years I was like pitching this book, like at at writing conferences and, you know, cold querying. And like, I would just get like, people would look at me like, kind of like I was crazy. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Like, this is so wild. And and then, um, you know, now the book is out and everyone's like, how did you know? And um, so I try to explain like, you know, this is, uh, you know, in healthcare been going on for a while. So I don't feel like, there's anything like special about me that was able to see it was coming, I guess. Um, you know, for whatever reason, I just, you know, just spent seven years of my life trying to write the book. So maybe that's a, a, a little, um, not typical, but, um, I think, and again, when I think back, just like all the reading I did as a kid, like, you know, reading all these thrillers that my dad loved to read it, just like, um, uh, so it just kind of internalized in my brain, like, uh, like this mindset of viewing the world in that way, if that makes any sense. No, it does. It makes absolute sense. And it is, it's funny how the world works that way. Sometimes that prediction, I mean, I know you weren't predicting the future, but at the same yeah. time, it's just like how the timing is, is impeccable. That's perfect marketing material, <laughs> right? Be like, Hey guys, Chad GPT <laughs> is a big thing. Here's what this book is. I don't know. I, I think it's really cool that, that you came up with that. Um, the, the thing is, the hard thing about asking questions like that is every author's brain works so differently. We've got discovery writers, you've got plotters. I know you've mentioned that you're a discovery writer as well. I am also. It's just kind of my jam. Plotting does not, I can't do it. It's just not my thing. Um, but I think maybe I'm wrong, but I, you know, people who, this is kind of general sentiment I've heard from people who haven't started writing from younger ages. It feels like there's more 
a concern and apprehension to move forward with something. And so I, I hear a lot of kind of middle-aged people starting their writing careers or, you know, later age saying, I just don't feel comfortable um, finishing this. Like I can start things. I can start things. I've got all these projects that I've started, but I'm not getting any of them to completion. And it's partially because they just feel like they have to reach this perfected state. So that's something that you felt um, when you were writing your books, did you feel like you had a hard time getting through each draft and getting the final version out? Or was that not a problem for you? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because I will say actually my first uh, two books, I did not. Um, the one I'm trying to write now, I'm having a really hard time with. And it's almost, I feel like the more you know, the harder it mm, is. Okay. And I think in some ways, because it was such an act of discovery and I just, again, like, you know, people talk about the muse and that was something like, I had never thought of myself as a creative person before. So just, but I just had this story strike me so strongly. And so I, um, you know, just would write every weekend. Um, I just wanted and needed to get it out on the page. And then after I had a first draft, I didn't know what to do. So of course I started Googling and looking at writing sites and, um, and then I, you know, learned a lot more about novels and story structure. And then, um, so then I went back and applied that to, to the book and had another draft. And then, um, I was very fortunate. Then I was accepted into this mentorship program called pitch wars in 2019. Oh, so that. Yeah. yeah, that I was so fortunate because I really, um, before that was like writing in isolation and then really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, but I, I, and we can come back if you want to talk more about that, but to get back to the question you asked, like, so basically because it was such an exciting process of discovery for me that um, I, I didn't ever lose that momentum. And then when I couldn't um, place the first book and um part of that I think was because of the COVID-19 pandemic you know I mm. set this one aside and then I started writing the the second one which um is a prequel and again I just had all these ideas for my characters about things that happened in the past um so I never lost that sort of energy um but I will say now, like, so now, you know, the first one's out, the second one's on the docket for November. So I'm trying to write my next book and I I am having a lot of uh, writer's block and just um, uh, feeling pretty stuck because I feel like, um, like I know more now, like I know more about a, what a book needs to be. And, and I find that a bit uh, daunting. Like, like sometimes I even like... <laughs> text or talk with my writing friends. And I'm like, I don't even know how I, how did I write two books? Like, I don't even know. I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> I questioned. I honestly, yeah. Sometimes when I sit and truly reflect on having written five books, I think, yeah. wait, did that actually happen? Like, yeah. am I imagining this? There's no way I wrote hundreds of thousands of words. Like I'm the type of person in college that would grumble over a 3000 word essay. So <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I totally understand that sentiment and the sentiment of, feeling more nervous the more you learn. I do I will add a little bit of perspective to that for from a fellow discovery writer. One thing that I have learned over the past few years with writing is to trust intuition. Um there's this writer's intuition that every author has whether or not you're a plotter or a discovery writer and I'm very into this whole intuition thing for two reasons. One because it just feels right the more you learn about it, this whole like intuitive nature to writing. And two, it alleviates some of that stress of getting it perfect and getting it right. So um, like I've mentioned before, I'm not a plotter. I, I don't, I don't do that. It's not my thing. Uh, as I've learned about this writer's intuition, it just, the reason it feels right is because it's on the basis of you have consumed stories from reading movies, TV shows, like you've been consuming this content. And in the meantime, your brain has naturally figured out a good structure an engaging structure of stories and everything 
And if you can tap into that intuition, it just kind of comes out naturally, right? And I think that's kind of the crux of discovery writing is tapping into this intuition that every every author has who consumes anything and being able to just kind of let it flow out and turn into it. And often it will align with these plotting helps or, you know, save the cat or whatever it says, these story beats or whatever you want to call it without ever having to actually do those things. And so I've tried to focus on that a little bit more because, yeah, I agree. Learning about all the story structure, saying, reading things that say, this is the right way to do it. All that makes me do is not want to do it. <laughs> Frankly, it's just like, I don't want to write the book. I'm overwhelmed yeah. about trying to map this thing out. Um, so I don't know. I can I could just, just validate that feeling. It's totally a real feeling. Yeah, I agree with you so much. And I just wanted to share something that's sort of... Um blew me away about like that intuitive process. So like in the process of writing my second book and revising it, I, I realized that I had a false villain and a true villain. And, and, um, and I didn't know that at first until Mm -hmm. I finished and was revising. And then I was like, wait a minute, this person is the, the real villain. And this is kind of cool because, um, you know, it is sort of like a natural twist, but then when I when I went back and looked at um, and I agree with you, like I don't map out the story structure ahead of time. I like go back and look at like, OK, where are my plot points? And if I do need to adjust them a little bit to fit that sort of um, pattern that the human brain you know, needs with story, like I can do that in revision. But I but when I discovered who my villain really was, I looked back at like the percentage points of the book and I had pinch points for that person, for the villain mm-hmm. at like the exact parts in the book. And I was just like, and, and like, that's like the fun part of writing. Like it was, it was so, it was so fun. And I think you're absolutely right. That's like, that's what I, and, and like, there's a part of me that knows I need to do that with the book I'm trying to write now. But like, um, I think I have this big fear of not, not being able to do it again, like this fear of failure and like, maybe these first two books were just like this, this weird um, glitch in my life and I'm never going to be able to do this again, but I have to just, yeah, I have to just get over it and just write. Um, So thank you for this because you're inspiring me and hopefully I'm going to be able to, to get back to that. (laughs) I guarantee you will. I'm, I, I I don't feel like I'm like a um, a font of knowledge because I'm (laughs) so inexperienced still with this whole offering and publishing thing. However, I can say with affinity that I've never truly experienced any writer's block. You know, I ever, I don't think I've ever experienced that. Have I had days where I don't feel like writing? Yes, those happen. I'm just like, I'm not in the mood. I don't consider that writer's block. I just don't feel like writing. Um, And I think part of it has, has become, I just, I've learned to like open up this window into my brain and I just slide into the story at whatever place I stopped and it just writes like I'm reading it for the first time. And because I've been able to access that, I don't care if I don't know where I'm going. That's actually exciting. So like the the less I know about the story, the more exciting it feels. Now, as I write it, I generally get a sense of this, how this book is going to end. Am I okay with that? It doesn't really matter at this point because my brain has already written it. But, um, and you kind of have maybe those few scenes that slot in. Um, But I don't worry. Like, I don't worry about what comes next because it'll come. I just sit down and I start writing and it just comes. So it's kind of fun. Um, I, you aren't the only person that has experienced that. So definitely don't feel alone. I just feel particularly grateful that I haven't been too kind of inhibited by those fears. They're still there. I mean, every author has those thoughts. Yeah. So, but in the process of your second book, so I just a little bit of information about your books because we're talking thrillers, your first book and the second book are related to each other. Is the second book the one you're working on right now? Is that what you're... No, actually, the the second book is finished it's and written. it's okay. uh, slotted for publication. Same publisher, uh, November, early right? November. Um, uh, but it is it, so basically. Um, so in twenty twenty, I put the first book aside when um, I just wasn't getting anywhere with querying, and mm. then um, in the you know beginning and middle of COVID nineteen pandemic, you know it was really clear. Um, most agents and publishers were not interested in um, uh, a medical thriller. Mm -hmm. And so I put it aside and then I followed the, you know, um, 
well-worn advice of write the next thing to get, you know, get over that grief of putting your first book aside or shelving it or what have you. And so, um, uh, so then, um, after like probably about a year of drafting the first book, I mean, sorry, the second book, then I needed to put that one on the side to rest before I, um, you know, went back through for revision. And then I went back to my first book because I was just like, you know, it's really like people say like, you know, the book of your heart. And I just really believed in it, even though I couldn't get anyone else to believe in it. And then, um, I just, you know, did more research and started just looking at, you know, there are different paths. And I just thought, you know, I think the path of getting a literary agent for this first book is just maybe not going to happen. And maybe that's okay. Um, but I also felt like this urgency to get it out in the world. And, and I'm really glad I did that because I think, again, the timing of it just, you know, happened to mm -hmm. the publication date coincide with this. So I, um, you know, I um, submitted to small presses and that's how I ended up finding my publisher. So I think that's amazing. I, I love how many different options there are for publishing. Um, obviously, vanity publishing, stay away from that. We won't get into that. The whole pay tons of money to publish, it's 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 tricky there. But I think it's great that there's those that options for independently publishing, small press publishing, traditionally publishing with an agent or without an agent. It's, it's great that you discovered those different ways and you found the option that worked best for your book at this time. So with the book that you're currently writing, is the intent then, do you have a contract with Black Rose to publish the this current work in progress with them as well or is this kind of you can do whatever you want with this one when you're right done? um no i so i each contract for the first two books was like a like individual Got it. book contract so um yeah so this next one um again like i feel like it's premature to even talk because it doesn't really exist yet right except in my head right, sure, <laughs> i yeah. have like two chapters um but um yeah I, I so i'm not sure what path i'm going to choose with this third one i think it'll um you know just just depend on kind of uh when i finish it and uh when it's ready um which again my uh, knowing my process and um just also having a day job, I just, you know, have to accept like, it, it's going to be at least a year and, and maybe longer. And um, I think that's also now that, like, I'm realizing as we talk, like, maybe that's been one of my blocks is that, like, I feel this kind of pressure, like, I should be able to do it faster this time. Mm -hmm. um, um, But I don't think I can. I think that's my process. It's a discovery process. And I, I don't have time to write every day and that just is, is what it is. So. <laughs> I mean, I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, part of the reason I started this podcast was to help. I think there's a majority of authors, like, let's be frank, a majority of authors who they've got life, they've got tons of responsibilities and they have this dream or this passion for writing and they feel that it's, you know, is inhibiting their creativity. It's inhibiting their ability to write. And, you know, I think that's the wrong perspective to have. And I don't think anyone means to have that perspective. But at the end of the day, your life, you're living with families, you know, pets, responsibilities, you've got school, work, whatever you've got going on. And then you've got this writing thing. All of those experiences can and should work together to enhance each other. And so your writing time, even if it's sparse, let's say maybe once or twice a week, becomes that joyful experience rather than a contention, a point of contention in your brain saying like, oh, I only get to write once a week. I hate my life. It's like, well, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's not the right perspective, right? Yeah. I wish that I could write all day long. I mean, let's be frank, I probably couldn't, but I would love to yeah. write, write three hours a day. I just can't, right? I, sometimes I've got a 20 minute block. Sometimes I got 15 minutes and I just recognize that and I just enjoy it when I get it. And it's just so fun and it becomes a joyous experience rather than this frustration. So I just want other people to see that. I'm glad to hear that you, you know, you're busy. I mean, you're just a doctor, right? That's, <laughs> that's minor. It's not a big deal. But in terms of like your schedule, I would imagine that your schedule is probably not regular. You don't have everything scheduled all the time. So how do you make the time for writing with yeah. your busyness? 
Yeah, I would say, I mean, mainly it's writing on weekends. Um, Mm -hmm. And my kids are teens now, so they sleep a lot on the weekend. (laughs) So, so um, I usually then, you know, get a couple hours in on like Saturday and Sunday mornings, which is great. And, um, uh, you know, I will say like a few years ago, I was able to sometimes write on weeknights, uh, after work, but, um, you know, healthcare has just gotten too crazy and and I just give myself permission now. Like I don't beat myself up for not writing Mm -hmm. after work. Um, uh, my brain is just not there. Um, but I would say that often during the week and whether it's at work or after work, like, um, and I think like all writers do this, like, right. Like our, there's like a little part of our brain that's like always thinking about the story. And like, sometimes you just get these like flashes of like inspiration um, for your plot or your character. So I just like in the notes app on my phone, I just um, I've learned to grab that and put something in right away because otherwise, like, I think I'm going to remember. Cause I'm like, this is such an obvious breakthrough. Like how could I forget this? <laughs> but if I don't, if I don't put it down, um, like, because sometimes it's like these, like, these like fleeting connections, you know, that your brain is just like barely making. Um, but if you just like write down a few words to remind yourself what, what you were thinking. Um, although I would say sometimes that backfires when it's like middle of the night and then the next morning I'm like, what does this mean? Yeah. I have no idea, <laughs> but you know, I still, put, I still learned like to just put it down anyway. And like, even if I only use 10% of it, like, um, uh, and, and so the thing I love is like listening to other podcasts or reading other interviews where like, um, like I've seen so many writers talk about that same thing and like realizing like, Hey, it's not just me. Like, I don't have this weird brain. Like all of us are doing this. So, <laughs> Well, but I think what you described is the, the, it kind of is the trick to writing as a busy person, right? Yeah. You're not, you're not, you're always writing even when you're not writing. I think that's what people forget is that when you're driving in the car or, you know, when I'm doing animal chores, because that's what I'm doing for part of the day, um, leave that space for your brain to make these connections to just think about your story. That makes a huge difference. Cause then when you actually get down to the writing session, you don't feel confused. You don't feel like, I don't know what to do, you know, right? Because you've been thinking about it. And even if you don't follow the exact notes you've written because you're a discovery writer, it's still... It's kind of like, I'm going to use this analogy, but it's not, people might not connect with it in terms of acting, right? I did some acting when I was younger. Um, It's kind of like staying in character type vision, right? You're staying in the story, even when you're not, not to a distracting level because you've got to do work, but it makes a difference when you actually get to the writing. I wish that I wrote things down. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, I'm so bad at that. And for some reason I've adopted this kind of mantra of, if I remember it when I get to the writing session, then it's meant to be in there. If I forget it, then it's not meant to be in there. Don't follow that advice. That's horrible <laughs> advice. Like someone listening, just take notes. Like it's not a big deal. But I just recognize my own flaws in that. I just won't take the notes. I don't take the time for it and I never have. So I just appreciate the story as it comes out without yeah. my cool revelations and just trust that a new revelation will appear uh, if yeah. I can't remember the first one. So. Once again, not great advice, but that's generally how I handle the situation. So when you do take those notes, do you keep it all in one spot or are you inadvertently putting them in random places that you have to piece together? Oh, gosh, it's all over the place. Like I have this uh, like like fear if like I was in a coma and like someone like looked at my notes app on my phone, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I try to title it. So, so like, I will have things like, I have like, like book ideas, short story ideas, essay ideas. And then like, um, and then like, if it's like the work in progress I'm working on, like I, um, I'll, I'll put that title in, but I was actually, I was looking at it this morning and I noticed like, I have multiple ones for my work in progress. So like I need to get those all in one because um, uh, sometimes like I do forget that I've even put something in there. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah, it's not super organized. Again, like you just said, don't follow, don't follow that advice. (laughs) Well, I think it's an important thing to discuss though, because, you know, I think there's something kind of um, comforting knowing that there's other people, other writers who also aren't organized. (laughs) 
because I'm yes. not super organized. Now, is it great? No, but at least you don't feel alone in that. So yeah. the reason I asked is because I don't know. Like every time I think to take a note, I'm like, I don't know where to put this. Uh, when I take notes for my personal life, I send myself a text. Like that's yeah. so archaic. Who, who does that? I feel like I'm an, yeah. I'm aging myself by texting myself notes, but it works for me. And I generally remember those things. So um, moral of the story, find, see if you can find a place and try to keep it all organized if you can in the, in the moment. Um, I think that probably would help once again, coming from someone who doesn't take notes. So there's that. Maybe we could ask an expert on the matter. But regardless, <laughs> I, I, this has been an amazing conversation. There's so much more we could dive into with this story or excuse me, with this topic. Um, but we're running out of time. So before we go, I always love to ask the author, where can people find more information about you and your books if they want to check them out? Yeah. So, um, well, here is, uh, here's my book, the Thanks. algorithm will see you now. And so this is, um, on, uh, Amazon for ebook on Kindle unlimited and then paperback wherever books are sold. And then my website is just my name, Jennifer com, And you can find all my social media links there. Um, uh, mainly on Facebook author page and LinkedIn and Mastodon, but probably easiest just jenniferlyset.com. Perfect. I'll put these all in the show notes so you can access the links super easily if you're listening. But thank you for your time. This has been an incredible conversation. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed being here. I thought that was interesting and I hope you thought it was encouraging as well. So it was great to have kind of a real time discussion with JL. I know that she has been experiencing some um, challenges, some writer's block, and it's just great to pass the sharing, you know, the learnings that you have as an author. I mean, no matter where you are in your authoring, there's a lot you can share with each other. Plus, it's encouraging to see it from a positive perspective. Um, getting started with your writing, even if you, you know, were hoping to start when you were younger and you didn't have a chance to, there's there's always a time for that. Um, I'm always looking for people to join the podcast. If you are interested to join me on The Casual Author, definitely email me at authordkenner at gmail.com. Or, of course, you can go to just dankenner.com slash podcast. There is a pitch form there. Love to hear from you. Share with your friends. And I hope to see you next week. Mm -hmm.